This video includes a paid sponsorship from Span, but more on that later. As I've talked about quite a bit in the past, Tesla has a lot riding on the successful ramp of their 4680 battery technology, and these batteries really are the linchpin to them reaching anywhere near 20 million vehicles per year by the end of the decade. But as you likely know, progress has been much slower than Tesla initially anticipated. With that being said, I do have some new updates for you about Tesla's 4680 battery production progress. And these updates come from uh, comments that Drew Baglino and Elon Musk made at Tesla's most recent Investors Day. So without further ado, let's dive in. I'm John and this is CleanerWise. Tesla could have gone the easy way and stuck with a proven a wet electrode manufacturing process for their 4680 batteries. And even without the dry process, their 4680 battery technology would have still had some advantages. However, their dry electrode manufacturing process really is one of the big key technologies that allows them to build out battery factories with a 10x smaller footprint per gigawatt hour and a 75% reduction in investment per gigawatt hour, thus making mass production of batteries much more attainable. For example, the current Gigafactory Nevada factory has around 6 million square feet of manufacturing space, and Panasonic takes up around 4 million square feet of that for 2170 battery production, and Tesla uses the rest of the factory to make battery packs, drive units, and power walls. Interestingly enough though, of the 4 million or so square feet that Panasonic currently takes up to build 2170 batteries, somewhere around 50% of that is dedicated to manufacturing the electrodes of those batteries, obviously using a traditional wet process. However, Tesla's dry process, once again, takes up substantially less space and eliminates many steps from the process, thus making terawatt scale production much more affordable and attainable in the somewhat near future. So because of all this, once again, Tesla's dry battery electro manufacturing processes are extremely important to their goals for the future. And thankfully, Tesla did give some updates at their recent Investors Day about this dry battery electrode manufacturing process. And I want to dive into those comments. But before I do, I want to introduce the sponsor of today's video. Thanks to Span for sponsoring this video. If you're currently considering a solar and battery backup installation at your home, or if you are looking to upgrade your current electric panel, you definitely need to check out Span. Replace your old electrical panel with a SPAN smart panel to access remote circuit level control and energy generation and usage monitoring with their iOS or Android app. With all of the data that this smart panel will allow you to have at your fingertips, you'll be able to use that data to make smarter energy usage decisions and even possibly save on your energy bills. To find out more and get a quote for your particular situation, go over to span.io or click the link in the video description. And when you do fill out that form to get a quote, make sure that you put cleaner watt in the comments section so they know that I sent you. At Tesla's recent Investors Day, which was held on March 1st, Drew Baglino started the 4680 battery update section of that presentation by discussing their dry electrode manufacturing progress. Drew referenced the video that Tesla showed back in 2020 at Battery Day that showed electrode powders manually being scooped into the electrode machine, then said, there's no spoon now, referring to the new fully automated electrode manufacturing machines that are now in operation at Gigafactory Texas. As compared to the old process, Drew added, from a peak productivity per tool perspective, this is over 20 times the productivity of the tools that we showed folks on the tour in Cato back in Battery Day. So we've made a lot of progress on one of the key parts of the cell manufacturing process. Now this process going from manual to automated is not completely new news because um, as I reported back in August of 2022, according to one of my sources, an electrode powder auto feeder was in operation at their Cato Road facility back then. However, as I also talked about in the past, Tesla was dealing with the electrode powder clumping as it went into the electrode manufacturing machine 
and these clumps were clogging this machine and causing some downtime. At one point, Tesla even used a Swiffer, yes, the Swiffer that you're thinking about, to help evenly distribute the powder so it didn't clump up and clog the auto feeder machine. So while Tesla's automation of this machine is not completely new, because this is something, once again, that I knew about back in August, of last year. Um, now that Drew actually mentioned that this machine is fully automated, I'm taking this as confirmation that by and large, the clumping issue has been solved and that this is no longer a major issue. As I and others have mentioned in the past, Tesla has been having quite a few issues in manufacturing the cathodes with a dry process, but apparently they've done pretty good and they figured out pretty reliably how to manufacture dry process uh, anodes. I was really hoping at Investor's Day we'd get a really clear update on Tesla's progress in manufacturing the cathodes with the dry process, but unfortunately, we didn't get a really clear update on that. During Drew's 4680 update presentation, a video played showing their new fully automated electrode manufacturing machine in operation. However, notice that the electrode foil in this video appears to be copper, which indicates that this machine is demonstrating anode manufacturing. Manufacturing. As a reminder, cathode materials are generally laminated onto an aluminum foil and uh, anode materials are generally laminated onto a copper foil. So Tesla showcased their dry anode manufacturing processes, but what about their dry cathode manufacturing processes? At the end of the Investor's Day presentation, during the Q&A section, in response to a question about Tesla's dry battery electrode manufacturing progress, Drew Baglino mentioned the following, referring to the factory tour that attendees were taken on. As you saw, this is a real factory making a lot of dry electrode in an automated fashion. We've made a lot of progress. We have clear end goals every week that goes by making progress towards those end goals, whether it's speed of the tool, yield of that process, or the downstream process. We haven't stalled out yet on the rate of progress either. That's both on the anode and the cathode side. So I do find it encouraging that Tesla hasn't stalled out in their progress and that they are moving forward. And at the end of the day, progress is progress. But unfortunately, this was the only direct update that mentioned the cathode side of battery production and Tesla's progress. We'll have to wait for official confirmation before we can really know uh, what's going on on the cathode side. Nonetheless, though, thanks to battery suppliers, Tesla has put themselves in a good position to have a bit of extra time to figure this all out and further perfect the process. On this topic, Drew continued, The great thing about where we are with the overcapacity that Elon mentioned is it's given us the opportunity to experiment as we go rather than just being like stuck to something that we happened to kick off a year and a half ago. When it comes to what Drew was referencing when he talked about overcapacity, he was referencing a previous comment made by Elon Musk about cell capacity and how they planned to have an overcapacity for their vehicle needs. And Elon Musk said, we actually deliberately tried to overdo cell supply to have that exceed what is needed in vehicles. Because if it goes below what's needed in vehicles, then the factories stall. But then what do you do with all these extra cells? The much easier thing to scale up and down is power wall and mega pack output stationary storage. So once again, Tesla has planned for an oversupply of batteries when it comes to how many vehicles they hope to manufacture and they use the extra batteries to manufacture their stationary storage. So this gives them a lot more flexibility on a product like a vehicle that has many more moving parts. Now on this topic, once again, Drew continued, something that Elon has said to the team many times is it's okay to scrap equipment or money. It's not okay to scrap time. So the way that we've been approaching it is probabilistically, what do we think is the most likely thing to succeed? And even actually in the factory here, you saw more than one anode line. They are actually operating two slightly different versions of the final process step of the powder entering the tool. It's a competition which is going to be higher yield, which is going to perform better. We have the luxury to be able to do that and we're taking full advantage of it to advance the technology as quickly as possible. So while I wish Tesla had completely figured out the best way to manufacture in their pilot facility, it still is encouraging that Tesla has bought themselves some time and they are able to figure this out once again at a smaller scale here at Gigafactory Texas before they really uh, put all these lines in other factories, including uh, the expansion of Gigafactory Nevada with 4680 battery manufacturing lines. After Drew made those comments about Tesla's dry battery electrode uh, manufacturing progress, Elon Musk added, the dry electrode problem is really quite a hard problem. We acquired Maxwell really just for the dry electrode technology 
but just illustrates what a gigantic gap there is between something working at small scale and at large scale. Elon then went on to reference a talented group of engineers that are working on getting this process right, then said, we've been grinding hard literally and figuratively on this for quite a while. It seems likely that we will be able to scale it to volume this year. Drew Baglino followed up to this comment from Elon Musk about scaling up to volume possibly this year by saying, we're basically increasing the output week over week, roughly 1K a week per quarter is our internal target and we're tracking to that. Now do note that when Drew Baglino mentions increasing output week over week by roughly 1,000 per quarter. I and others I have discussed this with are interpreting this as ramping production by 1,000 Model Y battery packs, not obviously just 1,000 battery cells. This is consistent with Drew's previous mention of a 1,000 metric back in Tesla's Q3 2022 uh, investors conference call. So if Tesla is able to ramp up at the rate here that Drew Baglino mentioned was their internal goal, so assuming they meet their goals, here's where Tesla could be when it comes to 4680 battery production at the end of this year. So once again, back in late December, officially on Twitter, Tesla tweeted out the fact that they were able to achieve a rate of 868,4680 battery cells produced in a single week. If you extrapolate this out, this is enough battery cells to build over a thousand Model Ys per week. Or if you annualize that, over 54,000 Model Ys per year. The current Model Y with a structural battery pack has 828 individual 4680 battery cells. So a thousand car sets would be 828,000 battery cells. So if Tesla quarter over quarter for the rest of this year is able to increase that rate by 1,000 car sets, it's very possible that by the end of this year, Tesla could hit an annual run rate of 4680 battery production of enough 4680 battery cells to build over 263,000 structural battery pack model Ys. When it comes to turning this run rate into an annualized number of gigawatt hours per year, if we assume that Tesla does not increase the energy density of their battery cell and we stick with the 86.5 watt hours per 4680 battery estimate per the limiting factor on YouTube, that would put us at an annual run rate of just a bit under 19 gigawatt hours at the end of this year. After that comment about Tesla's internal goal of increasing 4680 battery production, quarter over quarter, Drew Baglino said the following, once again referring to the dry electrode manufacturing machine. What you saw is effectively a ton of material per hour per tool. It's kind of hard to rationalize what that really means. It's different than, oh, like something works in the lab. When it's tons of material per hour, there's just different kinds of problems. Like even if you have 0.1% escape of fines into the enclosure that your equipment is in, now you have a dust problem. That could short out some electronics. Panasonic encountered a somewhat similar issue when they were ramping up Gigafactory Nevada and 2170 battery production because for the 2170 ramp, Panasonic was using new machines because in the past in Japan, they were manufacturing 18650 cells and not the 2170 format. During a conversation that I had in the past, I was told that the graphite powder, et cetera, caused wear and tear on the ball bearing production lines at Gigafactory Nevada. And all of a sudden, a bunch of the ball bearings would fail at the same time. And this caused downtime and was one of the factors that held up the production ramp. This is just a natural process that happens with figuring out mass production of batteries or really mass production of any complicated product. Drew Baglino continued, when you are on the lab scale, you don't even notice it. But when you are doing thousands of tons over the course of months, it's like, oh, a new failure mode we found and that's where we're at. But we're knocking those out though, and the team is grinding through it, but progress every week. So as a takeaway from a lot of this, Tesla is making progress, both on the cathode and the anode side, as was said previously. And Tesla is really putting their money where their mouth is, because once again, with their expansion and investment in Gigafactory Nevada and building out a 100 gigawatt hour 4680 cell factory, the small amount of space that Tesla has allocated at Gigafactory Nevada to be able to build 100 gigawatt hours of batteries really requires the dry process to work. At Tesla's Investors Day, after discussing the dry process, Drew Baglino went on to talk about factory improvements and discussed the fact that from Gigafactory Nevada 2170 battery production to Fremont 4680 pilot production, Tesla was able to achieve a 5x reduction in footprint. In context, Drew is really referring to space needed per gigawatt hour of production. In this graphic that was displayed, you can see that Gigafactory Texas 4680 battery production will be more efficient than their Fremont pilot line 
line and the future 4680 battery production at Gigafactory Nevada will be even more efficient when it comes to space. However, there's something here also at the bottom of this chart that I believe a lot of people missed. And that comes down to the part reduction of the 4680 battery cells. You can see that the 4680 battery cells coming out of Fremont, they have listed here 16 parts. But for the Gigafactory Texas and the Gigafactory Nevada 4680 battery cells, they have 15 parts listed here. With this reduction from 16 parts to 15 parts for the 4680 battery cell, this leads me to believe that Gigafactory Texas is now building the second generation of 4680 battery cells. Back in September of 2022, I reported that Tesla was building a small number of generation two 4680 battery cells at their Fremont pilot facility. Back then I pointed out that on the bottom of the new second generation battery cells is a new spiral indentation pattern with a divot in the center. The first generation battery cells do not have this same design on the bottom of the battery can. I was told in the past that with a new generation cell design, the separate interior current collector plate is no longer necessary and this new tri-spoke design plate connects directly to the jelly roll flags. In addition, this plate is connected via an automatic laser welding process. It was conjectured that the depressed portion of the tri-spoke design is what makes the electrical connection and that the three thin lines that you see are most likely the marks left by the welding process. So it seems like to me that that part that has been deleted is that separate current collector part and that has been replaced by this new design of a cap that can be welded on and really removes the need for that part. Hopefully we'll learn more about the second generation 4680 battery cells in the near future, but it's exciting that apparently Tesla is now manufacturing them. Now, as I wrap this up, Drew Baglino did give us a couple important updates as well, not only about their 4680 battery production, but also about the lithium refinery that they're building and their cathode processing facility. When it comes to the Corpus Christi lithium refinery, Drew mentioned that the capacity of this facility would be 50 gigawatt hours per year, and that Tesla planned to start commissioning this refinery at the end of 2023. When it comes to Tesla's cathode materials processing facility at Gigafactory Texas, Drew talked about the fact that this facility is going to have a 60 gigawatt hour per year capacity. And once again, they're targeting a 10 month total build time with equipment currently being installed for the first line. Drew discussed that they expect commissioning to start next quarter and actual production could happen just a couple months after that. So at the end of the day, while I wish we'd have gotten a little bit more information from Tesla, about 4680 battery production progress at this event. We did get enough details to know that Tesla is making progress once again, they are moving forward, and that they've bought themselves a little more time to figure this out and get it right with the battery suppliers that they're buying battery cells from. I'd love to hear your input on all of this in the comments section below. So please let me know what you think about this in the comments section. And also I wanna once again thank Span for sponsoring this video and say a special thank you to those of you who support me on Patreon because your support really makes a big difference and helps make these videos possible. If you'd like to find out more about the Patreon community I've set up and how you can support my work, I'll put a link in the video description. Thank you so much.